involved. Those are untestable theories. And they are not the subject then of scientific theories. Creation and evolution are inferences based upon circumstantial evidence. And they certainly do involve our particular religious views. Whether one is an atheist or an agnostic or a theistic evolutionist or a uh, theistic creationist, all of these things deal with the metaphysical as we try to explain origins. Now let me say that there is a great deal of turmoil within evolutionary circles today. Of course, the evolutionist hastens to add that this is a quarrel within the family. It's mainly a quarrel about the mechanisms, not whether evolution has occurred. Of course, I'm always wondering if we don't know the mechanism and we don't have the transition forms that the theory would demand, how do we know it's about? How do we know it's occurred? But anyhow, there is a great deal of turmoil within evolutionary circles today. It's rather significant. Here we are 125, 130 years after Darwin. The mechanism now is being challenged by increasing numbers of, of evolutionists themselves, and certainly the missing links are still missing. Here's an article published in New Newsweek, April 8, 1985, by Sharon Bagley. She says, quote, the great body of work deriving from Charles Darwin's revolutionary 1859 book on the origin of species is under increasing attack, and not just from creationists. And she describes some of these quarrels and disputes that are going on within evolutionary circles. Then she says this, quote again, so heated is the debate that one Darwinian says there are times when he thinks about going into a field with more intellectual honesty, the used car business, end of quote. I want to hastily add that was not a creation who said that. That was a fellow Darwinian. Now, furthermore, you know, one of the unfortunate things about this controversy is that evolutionists, one of the tactics that they have used is to accuse the creationists of distorting science, of quoting out of context, of telling outright lies. I think that's very unfortunate in a debate I have never accused my opponent of any of that. Even if I thought he was guilty of it, I would not accuse him publicly. Let you judge, you see. But I have a book with me written by a scientist who is not a creationist, he is not a Christian, so none of these charges can be made against him, and he's one of your own. Dr. Michael Denton, who is now engaged in genetic engineering research at Prince of Wales Hospital, he has two earned doctorates from British universities, he has a PhD in molecular biology from London University, and a medical degree from Bristol University. He's written a book called Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Now, according to Dr. Denton, on every count, evolution strikes out. Here we read in the, on the flap of the book that the theory of evolution as propounded by Darwin and elaborated into accepted fact by biologists, quote unquote, is in serious trouble. This sober, authoritative, and responsible book by a practicing scientist presents an accurate account of the rapidly accumulating evidence which threatens to destroy almost every cherished tenet of Darwinian evolution. Not only has paleontology failed spectacularly to come up with the fossil missing links, which Darwin anticipated, but hypothetical reconstructions of major evolutionary developments, such as that linking birds to reptiles, are beginning to look more and more like science fiction fantasies than serious conjecture. Most important of all, the discoveries of molecular biologists, of whom Michael Denton is one, far from strengthening Darwinian claims, are throwing more and more doubt upon the correctness of the theory. Now that's from a man, certainly was not professed to be a creationist, nor a Christian. And so these charges that are often labeled against creation certainly cannot be charged against Michael Depp, and yet he is saying precisely the same thing we are saying. And I may say he says it better, but he's a very fine writer, he's a brilliant scientist, the book is well written and very thoroughly documented. 
Now, really, today, there are thousands of scientists who are created. And literally, many thousands of scientists who reject Darwinian evolution and evolution in general, but have not accepted the alternative of creation. And there are many creationists today who are not Christian. They're not Orthodox Jew. They're not believing Muslim. They don't believe much of anything. Only they are aware of the fact that the evidence for design and purpose and complexity and much other evidence demands creation. There is something behind this universe that was responsible for its origin. I want to discuss some of that evidence tonight. You know, while neither creation nor evolution is a scientific theory, they each have scientific characteristics. And they can be discussed in scientific terms, which we'll do here tonight. Now, let us first of all try to define the theory of evolution just in general terms. As you know, one of the more popular theories on the origin of the universe tells us that some billions of years ago, all the energy and matter of the entire universe, what's in your body and in this building and the entire universe, was compressed into a huge cosmic gauge, subatomic particles and radiation. Now, nobody has the foggiest notion where the cosmic egg came from or how it got there. Someone suggested perhaps the cosmic chicken saved the cosmic egg. <laughs> I don't know about that. But nobody has any other explanation where it came from. But there it was, and then for some equally inexplicable reason, this cosmic egg exploded. Now, out of that, that explosion, hydrogen gas was generated and some helium. No carbon, no nitrogen, no phosphorus, no sulfur, no uranium, no lead, no iron, no copper, nothing like that. Just mainly hydrogen gas, and this hydrogen gas expanded out into the vast stretches of the universe. And that's all there was, hydrogen gas. That was the universe. From this hydrogen gas, we are told, stars created themselves, galaxies created themselves, our solar system created itself. On this planet, life evolved. And that first form of life, that little microscopic organism, through a series of genetic mistakes, and the death of the less fit, has produced man. We have 30 trillion cells in our bodies, or 30 million million cells in our bodies, of more than 200 varieties, 12 billion of which are found in our three-pound human brain. And since each brain cell is connected to 10,000 other brain cells, that means we have 120 trillion, 120 million, billion connections in the human brain, the most complex arrangement of matter in the universe. Where did that come from? From hydrogen gas. You see, ultimately, everything came from hydrogen gas. Someone has said, if this is true, then we could say that hydrogen is an odorless, tasteless, invisible gas, which, if given sufficient time, becomes people. <laughs> well, now, now, don't laugh, don't laugh. They really believe that. They really do believe that. You have to believe it. If there was nothing but hydrogen gas then, if we have people now, where did he come from? From hydrogen gas. Now, there's some intermediates, of course, along the way, but ultimately, we can trace our origin back to hydrogen gas. So everything has happened according to properties inherent in matter. There was no goal, there was no purpose, there were no engineers, no biochemists, no intelligence, no goal, purpose, or anything, you see. Everything happened ultimately by chance. And don't let anybody kid you. Fundamentally, ultimately, all of evolution is due to chance. Before life, you don't have reproduction. There could not be any natural selection before life had come into existence because natural selection is differential reproduction. And so in the chemical world, all of these processes are simply chance processes, and therefore all of evolution ultimately is due to change. Now, the creation scientist, on the other hand, says that this is not possible. This is physically impossible in the light of known scientific laws and processes. The universe could not have created itself naturally. Life could not have arisen spontaneously on this planet, and if they could not have created themselves naturally, the only other possibility that anyone has ever been able to think about is that they were created supernatural. 
So while evolution is natural, mechanistic, and continuing today, creation is theistic, supernatural, and completed. Now, that is all we need to say about either model. In, in evolution, you have neo-Darwinian evolution, you have punctuate equilibrium, you have the hopeful monster mechanism, there's even Lamarckianism left today, and various other notions. Among the creationists, you have the uh, progressive creationists who believe the earth is very old, and that God created during stages of time, stretching over hundreds of millions of years. You have those who believe in a recent creation and catastrophism. You have some who believe in other ideas. But they all fit under these two general umbrellas. So that's what we want to talk about tonight. Did this universe create itself naturally, or was it created theistically and supernaturally? Now, what predictions would we make? You know, you weren't there. I wasn't there. Dr. Heimer wasn't there. We, we can have a witness.